Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Horseman, Data Evangelist with Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing AI language models for enterprises. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section. If you would like to chat with us or chat with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch that to network with everyone. To find and open both the Q&A and chat sections, you can find the icons for those features in the bottom middle of your screen. As always, we will send a follow-up email within a couple of business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce you to our speaker for this series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best-known organizations. His strategies form the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He is a pro prolific author and popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lake, streaming, and data integration products. William is the number one global influencer in data warehousing and master data management. He leads McKnight Consulting Group, which has twice placed on the Incorporated 5000 list. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome, my friend. Thank you, Mark, and it's great to be here, and I'm very excited about our topic today. I am coming to you from Las Vegas uh, at Oracle Cloud World, and Gen AI and LLMs and vector databases have certainly been a huge topic of conversation, part of a lot of presentations and so on. As a matter of fact, I've been editing this presentation right up until we started with so much good information that I've been hearing and that I just wanted to share. Uh, a lot of rem I got a lot of reminders uh, in my conversations as well about aspects of this topic that I really wanted to share with you as well. So I'm excited to bring you this topic. It's very hot and very much the analytic professional needs to know about how to use LLMs in the enterprise. So I'm going to be giving you a lot of resources today. I'm going to be sharing with you how I think about these things and how I'm consulting to my clients about them. And I hope it helps take you forward uh, with your LLM strategy. Okay, so these are a lot of the logos that we deal with. Uh, we also consult to many of these companies, their investors, their, their customers, and so on. If you have any questions about any of these uh, technologies or anything in the space, uh, feel free to let me know. All right, here we are. Wow, the year's just moving on, isn't it? Here we are at September, AI language models for enterprises. And these are the topics, uh, the previous topics are mostly out on YouTube and Dataversity, I believe, dataversity.net. Uh, and the remaining topics, I will see you back here the second Thursday of the month for them. Okay, I am putting Gen AI in this kind of, uh, it, it, with these, types of technologies. These are the big technology ways from 19, or excuse me, 1440 to present. And you can see them all there. And here we are, Gen AI. I think it's going to stick around. I think it's a, it's a keeper. And is AI, here's a question for you, is AI the penicillin discovery of our time? Now, open, what, I, what do I mean by that? Well, penicillin wasn't built for its intended purpose today. It was just grown, I guess. And uh, we found a great purpose for it after the fact. OpenAI was not certain what it had created. It did not know, they did not know the eventuality of where it was going, not even to the, this point, let alone the future. I think they have a better grasp on it now. But Gen AI is a real bridge to the worker community of the enterprise. It is amazing, still to this day, the low penetration of business intelligence into the enterprise. And I've been working in BI for a long time. And depending on who you who you listen to, it's somewhere around 25, 30% maybe of employees that could use BI that are using BI in the enterprise. Well, Gen, with Gen AI, it's going to be so much higher. It already, already is 
already is. And uh, it's so simple to use, but there are dangers and there is a lot of setup information, which I'm going to share with you here today. So where'd they come from? It's an evolution of neural networks, which is a machine learning model that's inspired by the human brain structure and function. RNNs predicted the next word in a sentence, which is really fundamental to Gen AI back in the early 2000s. But what really kicked off the current momentum is this Google DeepMind team paper on Transformers in 2017. Does anybody know what that paper was called? It was called Attention is All You Need. And I've slogged through it, uh, be in the right mood for it, but uh, I've slogged through it. Uh, and it's a great foundational piece on uh, what got us to where we are today. And in 2018, OpenAI Open picked up on that and developed GPT-1, whereas traditional programming is instruction-based, LLM is teaching not the how, but giving examples and asking it to learn. So it's a real learning machine. And some of the critical points in this uh, evolution beyond GPT-1, there was BERT, GPT-2, GPT-3 in 2020. Interestingly, I think that was a real critical inflection point, 2020 as well for uh, GPT and Gen AI stuff. And uh, it was an interesting year, wasn't it? Gave us the pandemic and it gave us LLMs. What do you know? 3.5 GPT-4 in 2023 with 1.76 trillion parameters. So what's a parameter? Parameter is a variable that the model uses to make predictions or decisions. Yes, I'll get into how LLMs are formed here in a minute, but do know that they're doing nothing but getting better. They are getting better and bigger, and I've got an image for you coming up. LLMs are a type of AI model designed to process and understand human language and more. So trained on vast amounts of text data, and it learns patterns and relationships in the language, which it can then repeat in different forums, in different, uh, 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 we, when you put it into a different context, it knows how to reply in that context. Now, I said the word vast, and it, that just sounds like such a, uh, such a flash word, isn't it? I mean, uh, vast, wow, big. Uh, how's it get much bigger? I mean, I know that we thought the same thing about microprocessors and everything else, big data, right? But but truly, it's it, there's no limit to the data that you can put into this LLM. And the LLM makers have very judiciously moved fast through all the possible data, bringing that into their LLM. So that's real important. And I'll get to that as well here in a minute. The architecture is a deep learning architecture with transformers. Now, it's kind of like um, if you if you were on my, I believe it was May uh, presentation here, I talked about vector databases. That's the flip side to Gen AI. So if you want a full treatment of Gen AI, it's today plus that presentation. So I encourage you to find that and listen to that as well. But my point right now is that the LLM makers do not use vector databases. Um, although some of the goals are the same, they use transformers. Uh, and uh, these transformer-based architectures require significant computational resources, significant. As a matter of fact, that's a big, that's a big negative on this whole LLM business, right? The energy that the LLMs make, the LLM makers use to create the LLMs. The computational resources are just immense. They actually make a dent in the overall uh, energy usage of the country. And that is a big uh, challenge for this market. And they're doing some things about it. Um, are they doing enough? Time will tell. Capabilities are language understanding, text generation, translation, summarization, sentiment analysis, and question answering. I mean, how many of us are using things like ChatGPT instead of Google now for questions we would have posed to Google easily? I mean, I almost have a knee jerk to go to a Google 
search bar and type stuff, but but uh, I'm I'm retraining myself, I guess, over to uh, the LLMs because I get an answer, not a web page. I wasn't looking for a web page. I was looking for an answer, and I hope that the answer is good. They, they aren't all, so I'll get into that. So we're talking about images, video, audio signals, and the key components of an LLM are the conv convolutional layers where filters are applied to small regions of the input data, which scans the data in a sliding window fashion. So it gets through the whole data that way. There are activation functions which introduce non-linearity to the model, enabling it to learn complex patterns. There are activation functions which introduce non-linearity to the model, enabling it to learn complex patterns and pooling layers which downsample the data, reducing spatial dimensions while retaining important features. Hopefully I'm convincing you it's not a business that, uh, I mean, unless you're on here from Google, et cetera, that you really wanna be in and you wanna start using some of the LLMs that are already created. So I'm gonna help you with that. So examples we're all familiar with, we're all using them, image recognition, self-driving cars, medical image analysis, facial recognition, like in Facebook and so on. LLMs are trained. Yes, they're trained on this vast amount of text data. And I've already emphasized that vast is appropriate here to learn patterns and relationships in language and then repeat them back in different contexts. This training process enables LLMs to understand and generate human-like language. So where in the world do LLMs get their data? Well, Anything is fair game, I suppose. Web pages, books and articles, user-generated content, like social media and forums, product reviews, and good old Wikipedia. Yeah, look at some of these headlines. And we're seeing variations of these headlines all over the place now. NVIDIA, Apple, and others allegedly trained AI using 173,000 YouTube videos. Professional creators are frustrated by the latest AI training scandal. It's a scandal. There are tons of lawsuits going through the courts right now on model training on copyright material. I think the New York Times has a very public facing one. So we'll see. We'll see how that all plays out. For data guzzling AI companies, however, the internet is too small. They want more. And so where are they going to get more? They're going to get more from synthetic data. But before I get to synthetic data, here's another headline for you. These 183,000 books are fueling the biggest fight in publishing and tech. Yes, this is a, a, a more recent uh, headline here. There's 183,000 books that some LLMs were trained on. I was able to find out my book, <laughs> Information Management, is actually one of the 183,000 books that some LLMs are trained on. I am still waiting for my royalty check from, from these LLMs. I'm actually waiting on the royalty check from the, the book itself too, but that's a different story. Let's talk about synthetic data. And oops, I didn't mean for that label to go right in the middle. Uh, I will get to that later. Let me get back to slideshow this way. Yeah, these things happen when you're editing last minute. Okay. So what is synthetic data? Artificially generated information that mimics real world data. Sim simply put, it's information that, that the LLMs create. Now, I created this pie chart to- We don't have your slides up yet. Oh, okay. Um, let me do that. Apparently it took me down when I edited. Okay, how am I doing, Mark? Yeah, there you're back now. It's a good thing I was muted earlier because I was laughing at, at your excellent jokes. So, <laughs> well, you can count. We're at uh, the opening minute. slide. Yeah, yeah, let me push through now. Okay, here we go. Okay, this again, this stuff happens when you're editing last minute. I'm just so excited about uh, bringing you all this information. Uh, so, uh, look at this pie chart. Now, these are the parameters of GPT-3, 4, and 5. 5 isn't out yet. It'll come out supposedly late this year. But look at how much GPT-5 is just swallowing the others up. GPT-3, 
which a lot of us are still using, that's barely a sliver by comparison to what's coming in GPT-5. In, in GPT-5, it is estimated that about 70% of the GPT-5 data set is going to be synthetic data. Now, this is new. This is data that it creates itself. Dr. Thompson at lifearchitect.ai, and that's a resource that I want to give you, credit where credit is due. GPT-5, he says, GPT-5 presents a giant leap forward thanks to its unprecedented, unprecedented data sources. Compare this report to what GPT-4 gave us about data sources, which, by the way, they don't give us a lot of information about where their data comes from. How we know, or how we think we know, is by brilliant people reverse engineering uh, the LLMs and telling us what they found, like, oh, YouTube and, and uh, Wikipedia and so on and so forth. They're they've been very sketchy about sharing that information, and probably with good reason, because they get lawsuits against them. The use of synthetic data, however, is going to increase more and more. It just seems like the absolute natural route to go is synthetic data because the byproduct of all LLM, LLMs and generative AI creates synthetic data to scale models to sizes that reflect something close to the human. Now, um, I had up here a label, which I removed because of my my uh, my flubbing the, the slide, but that on that label, uh, my point was that these LLMs are not labeled. They're not labeled with uh, whatever information is in there. Uh, you should uh, test your LLMs for applicability to whatever it is that you're doing. And I'll get to that. But one final point on this is the context window in which we are interfacing to the LLMs. Isn't that good information? Not only good information to train the LLM on, potentially, I mean, I know we use shorthand and so on in all of that, but uh, isn't that good? In like, what if I said... Um, I am looking to buy a car. Summarize the uh, the top five selling cars in my market. Wow, that's good information for the car dealerships locally now, isn't it? And I would not be surprised if that was a use of our context windows eventually here. Okay, buyer beware. For a lot of us, it's easier for the app to do it all and back off from there, and that's kind of problematic when we say, okay, let's just uh, put the LLM in our application and let it do everything that it does, which is everything, right? Uh, even though we are, let's say, for example, and this actually happened, uh, and it, it's probably happening thousands of times across the country, but a car dealership put up an LLM to have uh, the customers chat with them. And in that, in that interface, you could ask it to debug your code. You could ask it for recipes. You could ask it for all these sorts of things that I don't think the car dealership really wanted to get into. And uh, the the uh, time will tell if the car dealership might be responsible for the things that are happening there uh, with the answers that it apparently you know is providing. Uh, the organizational culture. You know, make sure that it's ready for this. Uh, I would say give give it an error. I'd like to see the LLMs and our applications that use LLMs, LLMs give errors rather than just BS the way through it like the LLMs do today. Now, here's a resource I want to introduce you to, LLM Guard. I recommend it. It is for sanitizing, uh, for uh, uh, scrubbing bad language, for protecting data leakage, and things of that nature uh, that happen with LLMs. So I think it's something like this, if not LLM Guard itself, which is open source, by the way, um, is, is also very necessary if you're getting into the use of LLMs. So there you go. Labels, again, it would be nice if our data was labeled from these LLMs. And don't forget to give a lot of good user education around this. Uh, now, the, the image that I show here is called Slow Goth. Those of you that know your Lovecraft writing, that's Shogoth, and that has been used, that image has been used to represent the LLM, so I wanted to squeeze it in here somewhere. So yeah, kind of a lot going on there. Here's one more. 
the EUAI Act. Have you heard of this? You need to hear about this. The European Union, as always, is ahead of the United States in terms of acting on regulations. Uh, it is a common risk structure for AI with specific requirements for Gen AI providers and users. Providers include customers passing along access to LLMs like that car dealership I talked about. So yeah, in the EU, you're responsible if you pass along bad information or dangerous information through your use of the LLMs. And how would you ever know all the different ways that a customer might use your LLM unless you're putting up LLM guard, unless you're using a small language model instead of a large language model, et cetera. The EU AI Act comes with fines. It began very recently. And it's really about having you have good change management. And the companies in the US that operate in the EU, EU need to comply with this. So you're not off the hook if you have a European presence of any nature. Now, I had some conversation this week with several of my esteemed colleagues, esteemed analyst colleagues here at Cloud World. And I was frankly surprised that many of them uh, are completely against any regulation uh, in this area of any kind. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, you decide for yourself where you where you think this should be. I'm telling you where it is. But um, there's definitely a, a, a movement afoot to um, not regulate uh, as much as the EU AI Act here in the U.S. Time will tell on this, but keep an eye out. Okay. The steps in LLM. Uh, and I'm going to go through this quickly because this is what the, the big boys are doing to create the LLMs. We're not all doing that, but it's tokenization. What's a token? Very important. It's like a word. It's like a word, but it's usually uh, for a big word, it's a big word gets split in different ways. Now I've learned that one LLM model uh, uses every four characters of the word in a token. Okay. You know, they're all going to do it a little bit differently. Uh, and then you do your embeddings, which are similar to what we learned about in the vector database talk in the vector database world where you uh, vectorize anything or you convert it into a series of floating point numbers. Uh, and then transformers, that's what the, the T in GPT is, the transform. I talked a little bit about that uh, before. Multi-head attention algorithm is what it is. It tells the models how much words and order is contributing to the sentence as a whole. Multi-head attention is a mechanism that allows machine learning models to consider multiple relationships between different parts of an input sequence and assign different weights to different parts of the input sequence. So um, that is what they're doing. And this is how they are trained. They do the data collection, a lot of scraping of the information that I talked about before. They do pre-processing. Uh, the model architecture is designing the LLM architecture using transformers. And finally, the training. The pre-processing, by the way, skipped over that, that can take days to weeks, days to weeks. And you might say, well, isn't that a, you know, something that it should do on a regular basis to, to keep up? Well, uh, some people that have looked into this have determined that that's not really that necessary. Yeah, once in a while, you got to do that. Uh, but what, what is important is the quality of the data that goes into the pre-processing. So continuing to get quality data uh, into the pre-processing is uh, going to uh, determine uh, to some degree the quality of the LLM itself. So how does this all work? Let me, let me just try to break it down real quick here. Again, we're not doing this. This is what they do. But the LLM begins with a sentence from a data set like, the sun was shining brightly in the clear blue sky. And it randomly covers up some words in the in this sentence, like the blank was shining blank in the clear blank sky. And then the LLM tries to predict the missing words based on the context of the sentence. The LLM checks its predictions against the original sentence to see how well it did. And it learns from that and goes forward in its understanding of language. It's a fill in the blank game that it plays with itself in order to get better. 
And over time, it gets really good at understanding language and generating human-like text. And so you might say, but it doesn't give me the same sentence back every time. Well, yeah, a lot of that has to do with the temperature setting that you have on the LLM. So I'll talk about that in a minute. So to build the LLM, you need data, lots of data, compute resources, which include GPUs, include TPUs, like that's optional, but Google's tensor processing units are used for accelerated training. You need a cluster. Scale the training across, across a cluster of machines. You need an algorithm, which you implement like Atom or SGD. The, you need an objective. Define a training objective, like mass language modeling, whatever you're trying to uh, achieve by building this LLM. Lots of challenges in building an LLM, data quality and availability, computational resources and sca scalability, model complexity, evaluation, and ultimately the fine tuning, which is done by uh, the customer, mostly. Training can take weeks, months, or even years, okay? This is not for the faint of heart. Building an LLM requires a multidisciplinary team, significant resources and expertise in NLP, deep learning, and software engineering. So who has that? Who is doing that? Well, here are some of the most popular uh, providers of LLMs, the big names. Okay, OpenAI, let's start with them. They started it. Known for its GPT series, GPT-3, 4, et cetera. These models are among the most advanced in the field. And I'm going to share with you some uh, some rubric, if you will, on how to evaluate these LLMs. Google has its Lambda and Gemini, which I think a lot of us are familiar with. Meta AI has developed the Llama series, all right? Anthropic, don't forget about them. This AI safety and research company has developed models like Claude, Microsoft, yeah. They've collaborated with OpenAI on projects like Azure OpenAI Service. They also have one called Phi3, which I haven't used, PHI3. NVIDIA, they were here uh, uh, at the show, at the Cloud World, talking about this. Nemotron 4, 34, 340B. Whenever you see a number after the name of the LLM, that's how many parameters that's using. So they're bragging on 340 billion parameters. That number's only going to get bigger. That's a big number, though. Open source has some other ones. By the way, uh, the meta one is open source. Um, others like Bloom are open source. It's a dynamic field. And I'm not meaning to say that some smaller companies aren't doing this. So yeah, that's the focus of the company. There are dozens to hundreds of these. Hard to keep up. It's the Wild West right now of LLMs. And by the way, we see benchmarks. And you know I'm, I'm big on benchmarks. But there's a lot of... Uh, leapfrogging going on in, uh, in, in, in the bragging on the benchmarks out there right now. Now, RAG and LLM, just a note on this. Uh, RAG is combining the strengths of LLM and external knowledge sources, it, and it's a powerful duo. So uh, it, you would combine your LLMs with probably internal vector databases. You could do it relationally too, but um, mostly uh, you would combine uh, LLMs with your data in a vector database. I'm not talking about RAG today. That would be a whole hour in and of itself, but vector databases support RAG. Again, back to my May uh, Advanced Analytics webinar for more information on that. LLMs process natural language queries while vector databases process vector-based queries. And so there's a lot of benefits to RAG, and a lot of you are going to do this. Now, I'm going to go kind of quickly through some uh, use cases. Some of you will recognize these because I talked about them, I think, in last month's Advanced Analytics uh, webinar, where I talked about where AI was actually being used. And of course, Gen AI with LLMs is a huge part of how AI is being used in enterprises today. And you look across some of these, I'm not going to go through them in detail, but you look across some of these and uh, I, I couldn't, couldn't help but think that this is maybe the first time we are seeing what I would call right brain computing. Yeah, we, we're, we've been used to precise answers 
in the past, very left brain stuff, right? And this is more right brain. You're open to some creativity, which is very cool. I think Brinks Home, they leveraged AI to optimize service call scheduling and cross sell recommendations. I hope to be planting some seeds uh, with you in terms of how these LLMs might be used. Compliance uh, replaced a rule-based algorithm with AI-powered features and developed a new co-pilot chatbot. A lot of people are starting with chatbots. Okay, travel plan booker, giving you a nice travel plan if you're going from A to B. Estee Lauder, the voice-enabled makeup assistant for visually impaired users, yeah. Take a look at this video sometime if you get the chance uh, on YouTube. She's blind and she's applying makeup and the the app is telling her where she's getting it right, getting it wrong, how to improve it. Very cool. Lufthansa Group, its AI takes in crew availability and locations, passenger demand, aircraft maintenance status, weather, and many other variables. I did an exercise this week. I was at the Data IQ field trip. Uh, they're an important part of this ecosystem as well, by the way. Um, but they challenged us. Come up with some simple uh, use, use cases for Gen AI and come up with some really complex ones. And that got us thinking. A lot of us are on the simple side. Uh, my, my complex one, I think, was something like run the company. Just run the company. Take, take in all the information and run the company based upon a few key variables that I'll tweak once in a while. But otherwise, run the company, kick off processes, uh, et cetera. So, yeah. Um, Innova is an AI platform offering tailored financial an analysis and advice, demonstrating the impact of AI and personalizing financial services. So communicating about that. But not say, did I say Beyonce, no, Beyonce. AI algorithms analyze vast amounts of transaction data to identify suspicious activities and prevent fraudulent attacks. Uh, yeah, allows you to do things like transfer data, come up with trading strategies, things of that nature. Now there's other LLM use cases as well. Companies are using LLMs for programming assistance, summarization, I talked about that before, language translation, essay writing, and summarization again, wow, not very summarized there. Uh, and image captioning. So lots of uh, applications of this. Again, last month I got into all, all of those and more. Uh, now, just before I move on, I just want to say, you know, in terms of impact, uh, if I'm to, if I'm to sum up the impact of LLMs and and kind of really try to get your attention around this. The Walmart CEO said this, LLMs, yeah, he called out LLMs, creates or improves over 850 million pieces of data in the catalog. And without Gen AI and LLMs, this requirement would have taken 100 times the headcount. He said it. Without LLMs, 100 times the headcount to do their product catalog maintenance. Wow. It's that kind of impact. Now, how do you use the LLMs? Well, first of all, before I jump into the slide, you can have private LLMs. Um, you can have a uh, cloud or you can use it as a service, as most of us will, I think. How do you use it? Pick your cloud, um, get your license, blah, blah, blah. I asked my engineer to come up with this for me and uh, I said, keep it real now. It has to fit on it. On a slide, there's a lot more detail behind it, but uh, in the, AP, the AP, API will naturally go into an app. Most LLMs are going to be used by enterprises through an app, and the app might be built with Langchain or something of that nature. Uh, for example, in terms of the APIs, Meta AI has an official API for Llama. You register for an API key, configure API settings, as you see here, use Python, we use Python, you can use something else too, in order to send an API request to Llama in this case, receive the output data, build it into your pipelines. That's right. You might have a pre-processing pipeline where you're cleaning the text, you're tokenizing, you're normalizing, you're extracting features. You might have a post-processing pipeline where you're formatting the output, doing some spell checking and grammar correction, uh, evaluating the fluency. 
and re-ranking based upon what you are seeing. So good stuff here. Now I talked a little bit or I alluded to temperature before. It's a very important parameter uh, in your LLMs. Uh, low temperature, um, this is more deterministic, predictable output. You are kind of uh, with low temperature, you are taking the creativity away. You're saying, keep it straight, uh, give, give, uh, give uh, repeatable answers. And with high temperature, you're saying, be creative. Maybe if you're writing a novel, you want high temperature. You want it to be creative. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's just uh, less boring uh, to have high temperature. Uh, certainly very important uh, setting here, temperature, when it comes to text and writing. And how conversational you want to be with the user, okay? Do you want them to just get the straight story, uh, not engage, you know, if it's not part of your culture, you're a bank, you're a this or that, that, you know, you're more straight-laced, you want to keep it low. Uh, if you're a more modern company that, you know, wants to excite your customer more, you might have a higher temperature. Higher temperatures increase diversity in the generated text, while lower temperatures produce more consistent output, simply put. Now, another component, which I don't talk about otherwise, so I'm going to sneak it in here, is how many bits are used in the model. Yeah, we're using four bit most of the time because uh, mere humans are, it's okay for to use a four bit, uh, we found, but you do lose some accuracy this way. Uh, but for the, uh, the performance gains that you get, I think it's uh, worth it most of the time. You judge for yourself. It is said that you lose 1% accuracy as you go from 8-bit to 4-bit. And you lose 1% accuracy when you went from 16-bit to 8-bit. So it matters. How important is accuracy versus speed? That's something you're going to have to decide. Again, 4-bit though, good for us mere mortals. Using 4-bit precision for LLMs means representing weights and activations with 4-bit integers instead of 8-bit or 16-bit floats, which take up a lot more room, right? These are some of the top LLMs. I alluded to them before, uh, and don't uh, don't shoot me over the prices now. These are prices from July, and it they certainly can change, but I wanted to show you what they were at that point when I developed this uh, GPT. Developed by OpenAI, yeah, Generative Pre-trained Transformer. We know a little bit about what those words mean now, I hope. Strengths are exceptional accuracy, versatility, and API and documentation. And let me just, I'm going to get to a, a resource here in a bit that constantly evaluates these LLMs on accuracy. So, you know, they're claiming exceptional accuracy. How accurate are they by comparison? Well, GPT tends to be very accurate, but... I will show you the resource and uh, you can keep on it just like I will. Gemini is developed by Google. Strengths are efficiency, scalability, and the context window. Gives you a nice big context window. That's basically the, uh, the user input, the question, I guess, that you are asking of the LLM. Llama from Meta, Claude by Anthropic. Again, the prices are from July. Here are some other LLMs. The list goes on and on. I haven't used all of these. Mistral, Gemma, Code, Reca, and oh, by the way, there was one out there called Reflection. Did anybody see this one? Yeah, it was a fraud. It was actually Claude under the covers, and it was always just passing its information to uh, to Claude. So totally fraudulent. Probably taken down by now. I guess it's human nature. Anytime there's a uh, money to be had, uh, there's going to be some of that going on. So I guess watch out for that too. Hugging Face, very important resource for you to understand in this area of LLMs. We get our LLM through Hugging Face. Hugging Face is known for its open source transformers library. Yeah, which provides a wide range of pre-trained models. We get a lot of things from Hugging Face now. Wow. Yeah, we get some, uh, like for example, uh, pre-embedded vectors. For testing vector databases. Uh, and the list goes on and on. What a resource. Specializes in NLP and artificial intelligence. So get familiar with Hugging Face if you're getting into this. So how do you evaluate LLMs? Let me count the ways. All right. Um, and I've heard all these from clients. Well, I want high quality. Okay. 
uh, just high quality, no matter the cost, no matter the speed. <laughs> and you get into these conversations where uh, I think I said the other day, well, let's say you have 100 marbles and you have three jars. Uh, so the, those jars are quality, speed and price. So where are you going to put your models or your 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 marbles um, and, and go ahead and do that for me now? Uh, I started to list these ways to evaluate LLMs. I got about, uh, I don't know, 10 deep in this list and I got stuck and I said, oh, surely that's it. And then I discovered this resource again, credit where credit is due, artificialanalysis.ai. That's the resource I was telling you is constantly evaluating these LLMs for quality, speed, et cetera. Now, this is fan a fantastic resource for relative performance of these LLMs. I don't know what the machine spec is. That's important. The, the chip, et cetera, that's important. Um, so you can't really count on the numbers that you're getting there for, absolutely, I'm going to get this. I'm going to replicate that. So I don't know. I don't know what the machine spec is that they're using. They're using one and they're comparing everything on it, which is great. What a great resource. What it found, for example, is that when it comes to quality, GPT-40 and GPT-40 August 6th are the highest quality models, followed by Metalama 3.1, et cetera. You can read it. Output speed, Gemini, Llama, latency, sonar, and Phi-3. Price, open chat GPT-5 and Gemini 1.5 flash. Yeah, context window, giving you a nice big context window. A smart context window, Gemini 1.5 Pro. Gemini 1.5 flash, 1 million, are the largest context window models. Okay, on and on. So what do you care about? You care about quality, speed, price? Maybe a little bit of all of them. You care about quality and output speed. It has a uh, artificial analysis.ai has an evaluation for you. Uh, you care about uh, latency by input token length. They have an evaluation for you. So here are some things to know. There is a trade-off between model quality and output speed. That's undeniable. With higher quality models typically having lower output speed. Again, this is all the, uh, the, the, the timings I guess you're gonna get from this resource. It's on one machine, not a chip test. Chip is important, I'll get to that. Different use cases warrant considering different evaluation tests. Like Chatbot Arena, it's a good evaluation of communication abilities. Well, MMLU tests reasoning and knowledge more comprehensively. So there are different uh, tests that these can be put through and evaluated on. MMLU stands for Maximum Mean Logarithmic Utility. Yeah, it's used in learning management systems and educational technology to evaluate the effectiveness of adaptive learning systems. Chatbot Arena is the good evaluation of communication abilities. Well, MMLU tests reasoning and knowledge more comprehensively. Now, there are some benchmarks out there like Glue, but it's it's early days and it's not highly subscribed. Benchmark leaders are changing. This is not the time to commit hard to one of these models. You might have multiple models in the shop. It's going to get like cloud. Okay, in your shop, don't you have some AWS and Azure and Google Cloud? You probably do. It's going to get like that, where you're going to have multiple models in the shop. And it's before it gets crazy on you, think about something like Data IQ, which helps you to quickly POC the LLMs for its applicability to your application and allow someone to put governance over the LLMs in the shop and provide that kind of guidance. So the evaluation here of the LLM is not as straightforward as it is for other components of machine learning. There's a lot to it. Hopefully I've impressed you with that and you allot the appropriate time for that aspect of it. Okay, LLM chips quickly. This could be a whole hour. Uh, they're, they're provided by NVIDIA, of course, Intel. Uh, they've seen some stumbles, but they do provide in this area. AMD. Uh, I was at the AMD booth uh, presenting this week. And Samba Nova. 
and others. But these are some of the main ones. And you can see headlines out there. NVIDIA H100 GPU shipments by customer. Whoa, look at that. Who's the big customer? Meta, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Oracle. Yeah, all these players that are that are dealing in LLMs. That's where the GPUs are going. And there has been a shortage of GPUs, to be sure. I was going to do an evaluation of these myself, but I couldn't get the GPUs for it. Samba Nova holds a speed record on Llama 3.1. Now, I'm not really here to tell you that. I'm here to show you that you are going to see headlines like this, and hopefully you can understand them a little bit better. So these chips on equivalent machine, this chip was these chips are tested on well against competitors on the same machine, and Samba Nova discovered they had the record on Llama 3.1. And you know that is one of the LLMs. So that, and then you also know now that Llama 3.1405B, that 405B stands for the parameters. And wow, it's four times faster than the rest. That's pretty good, Samba Nova. So we'll see where all that goes. Keep an eye on that. That's an important aspect of your evaluation as well. Get on the right chip for you. Now, uh, just to be complete, Hardware acceleration and multi-worker help out a lot in these areas. And one company that I've worked with is called Bud Labs. No, they, they, they don't deal in marijuana. Uh, you might even look at their logo and think they deal in marijuana, but they do not. They are a lab dedicated to computer science and machine learning. And they leverage specialized hardware to accelerate AI computations such as GPUs, TPUs, mentioned that earlier, and ASICs, application-specific integrated circuits. So they are doing a lot of testing. They provide you with hardware acceleration and multi-worker. Bud Lab's multi-worker approach involves distributing AI workloads across multiple computing resources, which gives you scalability, flexibility, and efficiency. So Bud Lab achieves significant performance gains faster processing times, and improved resource efficiency for your AI workloads that are using these LLMs, CoreWeave and PyTorch, other tools for you to be aware of in this space. Consider adding CoreWeave to your LLM stack when you need to scale computing resources, when your LLM workload requires more compute power than your current infrastructure can provide. And PyTorch, some of you got to be familiar with PyTorch. Um, they help you with, um, they're an open source machine learning library that helps you with rapid prototyping. Their dynamic computation graph and automatic differentiation make it ideal for rapid prototyping and research. So some of you are going to need to get into those tools. All right. Limitations of LLMs, math. Yeah, believe it or not. Uh, logic, reasoning. Bias, yeah, oh, that's, that's huge. We could spend an hour on, on bias, i.e. human opinions. When it scrapes Reddit, when it scrapes YouTube comments, which to me, it's like almost a cesspool, right? When it scrapes these things, it's not getting the best of the best of uh, human language. And it may be getting some bias in, in some of that and passing that right along. So that's a limitation that you have to look out for. Safety, again, your context windows. A lot of companies have policies now about the use of LLMs. I don't think it's feasible to just say, no, we're not using AI in this company. No, we're not using LLMs in this company. That will not work. You have to work harder at coming up with a policy. Limitations, the data is static. It's not constantly refreshed or anything. Hallucinations. Wow, there are some famous funny hallucinations going on. Uh, I saw one this week from uh, uh, probably recently. I don't think this is necessarily improved, but show me salmon um, jumping in the river. And then it's bites of, of, of salmon as they, they're coming off the grill. You know, we're, they're not alive, but they're jumping in the water. Yeah, okay. And, 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 and these LLMs are so confident, aren't they? They're so confident in what they're telling us. It, yes, for sure. 
it is this. I don't know. I can't tell you how many times I have asked the LLM a question and got the answer and, and just knew it wasn't right. And I said, are you sure about this? <laughs> and and it comes back with, oh, sorry about that. Um, here's the real answer. And I'm sure I could go on with that. So you just got to be aware. Ethics all over the place. The scams, the misinformation, the fake images, text and opinions, fake images. Yeah. This is not a fake image, by the way, of that dog driving the car. I, I believe that's real. Uh, there are cars that are driven by dogs. I don't know what the point of that is. I just wanted to share that with you. Now, some models are censored to some degree. Um, most are not censored very much. Uh, that'll change. That'll change for the better. Uh, static data. Yeah, I mentioned that chat GPT can browse the web and it can grok from things like x.ai, which can access live tweets. So live tweets being accessed. Um, scary to think about tweets getting into the LLM. But this is all big disruption. And the future may be small language models. I've been talking about large language models because that's where the momentum is right now. But there are small language models that are specific to an industry. Um, different industries like healthcare, financial, legal, legal, excuse me, um, and um, what others, uh, medical research, and so on, where they need they need more specificity than generally grabbing me everything out of Wikipedia. And so these are becoming more available. And they can be applied at the edge because they're smaller, which is fantastic, in mobile devices, in real time, in IoT devices, and in specialized domains. And it gives you the industry-specific industry grammar. Um, or it might be just a smaller footprint general model that's going to perform better. That's also considered a small language model. Now, this is competitive these small language models are going to be competitive as we go into the future with uh, RAG, okay? We talked about that before where you're using your own information combined with an LLM. Uh, the, the point is you need to create your own information when there's going to be third-party small language models that might be able to provide you information. And by the way, I'm kind of, I've kind of glossed over prompting of these LLMs. Do your prompt engineering first before you jump into fine tuning LLMs, which is also important for you to do, which that's taking the raw models and fine tuning them for your use case. Okay, but prompt engineering is largely the problem and applications can, can do a lot at the prompt level before you have to do a lot at the architectural level to make these things work. The future of LLMs beyond small language models, right? Fact checking itself. Yeah, we look forward to that. Uh, that should be great, right? Uh, Multi-modality, improving reasoning ability and bigger context windows. And MemGPT gives you some bigger context windows. Very cool stuff. Um, so in summary, a lot of we covered a lot of ground here in LLMs. There was a lot to cover. And it still fascinates me how quickly this has just taken hold of, of our industry, our data industry, our you know, data people are needing to know this information so quickly here. Uh, it's a type of AI model designed to process and understand human language and more. LLMs are trained on vast amounts of text data to learn patterns and relationships and repeat that back. LLM use cases are abundant. I scratched the surface here today. Hopefully got you thinking. Top LLMs include GPT, Gemini, Llama, and Claude. Quality, speed, and price and combinations thereof are drivers of LLM selection. The future maybe small language models. Keep an eye out on that, especially if you're in one of the industries that I mentioned. So that brings me to the end of the presentation section. I'll turn it back to you, Mark, to see if we have any questions.
Yeah, this was an outstanding presentation. Uh, I I really enjoyed it. I, I I know a lot of people in in chat have been making comments throughout, and and we have some great questions. So I, I'm not entirely sure what exact order to to answer in these, but uh, we do have one fascinating question here that uh, that I'd like you to address. Um, talking about synthetic data earlier on in the presentation, synthetic data training is uh, inevitable, repeated, and and forms a kind of a feedback loop. So uh, dubbed model autophagy disorder or MAD. Uh, how do we how do we mitigate that feedback loop? Uh, and I I know I've done this. I kind of did, did this to a model on purpose, where I just kind of fed its answers back into it over and over again. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, how do we prevent that for synthetic data training? Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for for joining today and for um, uh, allowing me to be a part of of the education of your education on LLMs because there is a lot out there. But um, uh, hopefully, you enjoy the unique data diversity kind of teaching style that that we have here um, on LLMs. Now, Mark and everybody, in regards to this synthetic data, how do we stop it from feeding on itself and going down dark paths and um, <laughs> And uh, inaccurate paths, and, and 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 you know, going it, going to the inevitable uh, place where there's there's no turning back, and this is what the world will be uh, going forward because it says so. I don't know. I'm sorry, but I don't know. This is a this is a problem. Uh, this is a problem of of speed to market uh, versus versus uh, ensuring quality, and you can see it all over the place where this is a, a challenge for these LLM providers. The executive that left OpenAI probably did so because he was in disagreement with the pace at which OpenAI was releasing these LLMs. That's a very documented uh, a, a story of our, of our time. And uh, that just shows you that this is a challenge that they're grappling with and um, the only answer is really slow down and add add, add more quality to it um, because there will be backlash on their market if those LLMs are providing inaccurate data, getting people into fines in the EU AI. Okay, that's going to drive regulation, like it or not. That's going to drive more quality into these LLMs. Uh, and I talked a little bit about that. That's a very important part of this. So I think regulation and uh, the the vendors really slowing down and adding quality. There's nothing that you or I can do about it. Yeah, it it, it is an interesting thing to think about uh, too. And and I like uh, your answer there, and because it reminds me of all this discussion about red teaming AI models as mm -hmm. well. So making sure that they aren't broken by a malicious actor. Um, yeah. yeah. The chat's just exploding with uh, discussions about small language models, and I, I really enjoyed that part of your presentation as well. Uh, and it reminds me of ye olden days uh, when when working in AI and we'd build AI agents for things. What what do you think the role? This is a question from chat. What do you think the role of of agents would be, or or what role would they play? Ah, uh, you know that was a big part of the data IQ um uh talk uh this week uh but i don't really have a i don't really have a great handle on that in terms of uh how that's going to play in here small language models are uh not uncommon but i think may, are not common but i think we all see that that's that's a way forward to get these into the edge for example and so on and i think that agent technology is going to be definitely key to to that deployment so mm -hmm. Uh, I think the uh, the uh, the the chat has has made a good connection there between agents and small language models. Uh, man, I think uh, yeah, uh, whoever's developing the small language models will need uh, to deploy technology of that nature. And uh, I also think down the road that it's going to be much more possible for an enterprise to uh to become a a small language model uh provider of their own uh with their data appropriately scrubbed and so you know the wild west will uh will probably continue there yeah i think you're right well uh, thanks again to chat for being outstanding today uh it's been entertaining to watch and and thanks again william for this amazing presentation it was really really good um so thanks again uh that's all we have time for
uh, for today. So thank you everybody for, for coming along and asking questions and, and being amazing. Um, our community is so fantastic and, uh, we'll have the recording to this and the links to the slides set out within a couple of business days here. So thanks again, everybody, and have a wonderful rest of your day.